Okay, and I'm with the Anne Arnold Coalition Against Cell Towers at Schools. I want to thank you for doing this presentation today. And would you also agree that it's effing or whatever you, your medical term was, that it is irresponsible for school boards to approve 100-foot uh, cell phone towers up to three with five um, sets of co-locating on uh, school grounds? Do you think that's um, not really responsible? Well. You know, if you look at the <clears throat> biological activity coming from uh, the signals and you have co-location, as you were talking about, you're creating a, a cacophony that is going to be more biologically active than any individual signal. So, you know, the answer is uh, yes. The, the same comment applies. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sharma, yes. Uh, would you also comment on this? No, no, I didn't get to you. Yes, exactly. The question is about... Cell phone towers. Yeah. Do you do you think it's a good idea to have a hundred foot tall cell phone tower on a school ground with multiple antennas on it? No, I don't think so. This is corrected by because uh, on cell phone ground, then also because the radiation. Because you see, uh, I I didn't see, show you this slide where how this these radiation are imitated from the cell phone tower. The the main beam wherever it's going. The main beam is main responsible, and somewhere, certainly, some of your classrooms or other these areas where most of the times these children are there, they are going to be exposed, and they are very dangerous. And as her presentation clearly indicated, so when the children are concerned, uh, they have got a lot of water, water contents in compared to the adults. So the ions are more. The absorptions of these radiation in children are very high. So that's that's not at all safe. The and problem what is, is the recommendation of the Indian government about locating towers. No, my uh, what uh, my committee recommended that we should not at all install any cell phone tower in a school or nearby a school as well as in the hospitals area. It should be out of the rather we have. I am thinking to remove all these mega mega cell phone tower or micro cell phone tower from the highly densely populated area. It should go out of the uh, in this populated area, and then we can bring these radiations by using um, micro or pico or small cell phone tower, which have got less power. Thank you. I just want to say one thing. The problem the parents are having is is that they they are precluded from the 1996 Telecommunications Act from bringing up any adverse health effects and having any of these applications denied. So you have to rely on home values, depreciating, and aesthetics to try and sway public opinion um, against having these applications um, approved. And that's what the carriers and the construction um, companies are relying on and getting away with. We are well aware that our law prohibits considering health impacts of the location of tower by, as a matter of law. India has a, has a different law, but there's the same challenge that they're facing from, from the industry. They yeah. try to block them in, in lawsuits. Right. Um, this gentleman and then the lady there. Yeah. Okay. I'm Carl Polzer. I've been around town as a health policy analyst for 25 years, mostly in health insurance and financing, but as a parent, I got involved in this about 12 years ago. We're in Fairfax County across the river. There's a couple hundred thousand kids in the school system and a $2 billion school board. And we, cell phones were just coming in. So my wife sent this health policy analyst's husband an article about health effects. So I read about 200 studies. I don't have any training in biology. But, I mean, a little bit now. But anyhow, uh, then I found out that the school board was selling space at every school like fish. They had a map where you could go to with my, a contract. Bell the towers. Okay, okay. so the, the, the school's school, getting no, no, money. No, no, no. They had made a contract with Milestone, a company called Milestone Communications. And you could go on and see the altitude, longitude, and latitude of every school. And it was for, you know, the, the PTA got them. They had a contract where the PTA would, would sign off, and it was all hooked up so they'd get the acceptance. Oh, the to the up. Hmm. So we bought it for a year and a half, and I had a website. Uh, tech schools, and we got emails from all over the world. And this issue was up everywhere. And if you guys have been available then, I think the science has advanced. As an observer, I kind of got out of the issue for a few years. Um, yes, there's a lot more. The, the, the evidence that there's a biological effect is linear, greatly increased. And you, you're, I'm, it's wonderful that you and you are working on it, and I read your book when I was doing all this. But the social acceptance and the power of the industry is geometrically increased. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, that preemption, I th at the time, was misunderstood. 
federal preemption I saw in healthcare right. comes into play in, 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 in health insurance. So it was very familiar, the industry stuck it in there in the, the Telecom Act. It didn't say, people are, they say you can't bring it up as a health, you can bring it up, but not as the primary, at least at the, the case law when I was in on this, the case law said you could mention it, but it couldn't be the primary reason that a local entity could design, could deny the site. And under the Telecom Communications Act, the federal government basically says this is our domain, it's, it puts an electric fence around it, the states can't do anything on this, but it delegates to local zoning authorities the ability to site. So it basically gives them no power. So how much money does a typical school get for one of these oh, co-located towers? A, so I tried everything. I tried the evidence, I, but my, I had an ulterior motive of educating people about we, me and my friend that did it. The, the phones and the wireless networks, they would get nothing almost. In fact, the, the cost to the school, what we showed in a memo, the, the, the only thing that changed their policy, they were very stubborn, they're very arrogant. And some people said you would never change their policy. I showed them that the cost of the school board would be greater than any, any revenue they would get. What Maybe, was the revenue in the beginning? It was like a, I couldn't remember all the details, something like eight grand a year. $8,000 a year. Eight or 10 or 15, whatever you would. Right, right, right. But then you have trucks coming in and out. You know, I brought a guy in from New York showing Diesel. even the physical, you know, threat of ice falling off the, yeah. State building and chopping people up. Kids climbing on it, running pictures of, of lightning smashing up 20 cell phone, phone towers a year. Had guy, the, the health officer from, from uh, Salzburg, where they, where they had much stricter standards, write the post, had a big debate on the post back and forth. Magda Havis, I got her to write in. And, you know, and then I, this guy, you know, I was fighting these guys. But the thing with it, in, under Virginia law, the thing that got them was, because it wasn't, one of my main problems with it is you're using this school grounds for an industrial use that has a, a side effect, that has a, a, a bio, like, you know, you, would you put a pig farm on there? Uh -huh. Would you put a, a you know, one, like, you're... And then after the IARC said it was a possible even carcinogen, it just seemed to me that that's, that in and of itself ought to be pretty persuasive. But you know that the uh, a campaign was launched, uh, a campaign was launched after the I World Health Organization declared cell phone radiation and wireless radiation a possible human carcinogen, a campaign in the media was launched to try to discredit it. And so I talked to many, many scientists, including people here at the School of Public Health, most of whom who are not attending, and they don't even know about this. Right. And they've never heard about it. Now, I've recently published with other members of the World Health Organization group that I think it's a probable human carcinogen. Now, what other probable human carcinogen would you be exposing school children to? DDT, lead, engine exhaust, chloroform? It has nothing to do with the function of the school. As school. And under Virginia law, it turns out that the school board members, because it was a non-educational use, were, they're, they're responsible for any liabilities, 50% of any liabilities personally. Yeah. So they decided, well, maybe we won't, we, they, got, they thought it was safe, but uh, maybe we won't do this except, except at high schools. Oh. So we got like 180 schools off the table. But then they, later on, they delegated the whole decision making. I went away. You know, you can't do this for, for free for the rest of your life. Yeah. So yeah. now they delegate it back to the, the PTAs and the schools. So, we, you know, you fight it school by school. Um, but anyhow. Um, May I suggest that? Anyhow, it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's one, an example one, of how hard it is to fight it. Okay. Sorry, yes. One, one uh, comment. Um, you know, in our system, I'll put my lawyer head on for a minute. Um, in our system, truth and justice are not the same. And the science is on the truth side of the ledger. And, you know, we're, we're trying uh, for 20 years here, uh, trying to have truth prevail. But the justice side is really what is more powerful in some ways. And as, as parents, you have a 14th Amendment protection to parent the way you believe you should parent. And when a tower or Wi-Fi in schools interfere with your ability to provide safe education for your children, that's protected. Now, no one's ever tried that angle before, but it's real. It sounds like there's a lot. Uh, Dr. Carlo is also a lawyer.